In the coming weeks, Governor Kathy Hochul will unveil her executive budget proposal for the next fiscal year, which begins in April. And while the state is forecasting a $148 million deficit for the upcoming year, according to the most recent fiscal projections, the governor has recently said she doesn't see a need to raise taxes to close this gap or meet additional spending needs above and beyond planned spending. To make the case for raising taxes, specifically on wealthy New Yorkers, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Nathan Gustorf, Executive Director of the Fiscal Policy Institute, which has advocated for a more progressive tax code in the Empire State. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Hi, David. Thanks for having me on. So Governor Kathy Hochul has said uh, we don't need to raise taxes in New York. Uh, Is she right? So let's start with the general fiscal picture. Uh, You mentioned what's projected to be a a relatively small budget deficit in the context of about a $230 billion state budget. Um, That's essentially a balanced budget. And the division of budget, which generally puts out fairly conservative projections, has predicted balanced budgets really for this year and for the next year. So that's to say that the state's in a pretty strong fiscal position. And then the question is, does it make sense to raise taxes beyond our current revenue levels? The real p- purpose to raising taxes at this point, because we don't have any budget deficits or gaps to fill, not meaningfully, would, would be to fund expanded social spending. And given the recent COVID pandemic and the troubles that afflict many working New Yorkers, this is exactly the time when it makes sense to do expansive social investment. Um, At a high level, that means really beefing up our public services, expanding funding for essential care economy sectors like child care and elder care, making sure that public education is fully funded, really really investing in infrastructure. And those are the kinds of social investments that would make the economy really more uh, workable and more livable for low and middle income families in this state. So then what's the dollar amount that we should be looking to invest in in social spending above and beyond what we traditionally spend and are projected to spend? Well, that's a great question, and it does get into some of the underlying mechanics of how we might want to change the state tax code. But for starters, we could increase annually our revenues by around a few billion dollars a year if you you were really systematic about it. realm of five to ten billion dollars per year and over a slightly longer time horizon you could increase that by a few multiples and that would allow us to turn what are currently uh, fairly limited means tested subsidy programs into very effective comprehensive universal social services and this would i imagine apply to things like child care uh, what other sort of means tested services would be impacted by this Sure. So I think it actually helps to look at what's in the budget. And at a high level, uh, there are three major spending categories in the state budget. There's healthcare, education, and then government services. So healthcare and education are the two really big public services that the state provides. And those are the things that we would want to see expanded to be really high functioning, quality, universal programs. And there are a few subsidiary uh, categories within each of those. So when it comes to healthcare, you've got on the young end, childcare, and on the older end, uh, care for the elderly, whether it's uh, home care or direct care. Um, We'd also want some additional investments in things like the essential plan that make sure that, uh, you know, you have quality healthcare coverage for lower income New Yorkers. And there are other areas of Medicaid reimbursement that Um, probably need additional funding. On the education side, we really need additional funding for SUNY and CUNY. We need more money to go into pre-K and 3K. And that's on top of just making sure that the uh, foundational level of funding for public schools and local districts is up to par and really allows us to have the right uh, number and quality of public school teachers that we need. If we were to basically open up the spigots and dramatically increase spending on things like health care or education. Should the money come with any sort of strings or 
quantitative metrics to gauge our investments to ensure that we're not simply throwing money at problems that maybe can't be fixed just by money? So I, I really think that's a good question. It, it may make sense in some slightly different contexts. In the case of public services, it, the question works a little bit differently because say we have a lot of public schools, we have a lot of public school teachers, and whatever, um, you know, there are these debates have been going on for decades about how exactly should public schools be structured, but fundamentally, that's an incredibly strong, very important public program. There are other areas of state spending where you might scrutinize in a different way, you know, whether the way we're spending or the levels which we're spending really makes sense. So one of the characteristic cases is infrastructure investment where it can just become incredibly expensive and uh, really a very slow process to do pretty limited, uh, say, expansions of the MTA. Now, we know that the MTA faces serious uh, funding shortfalls and that it is absolutely essential to the basically the whole way of life in New York City, which is the economic engine of the state. So we know that we have to fully fund the MTA. And then, yeah, it might really make sense to say, hey, we need to find the ways to make sure that the dollars we spend uh, are efficient and go far and that we can expand transit or other public infrastructure, say sanitation, w without kind of getting caught up in endless delays um, or wasting money. But it doesn't actually change the underlying need to, to invest in, in those kinds of, um, say, public infrastructure or public housing. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Nathan Gustorf, Executive Director of the Fiscal Policy Institute, which advocates for a more progressive tax code in the Empire State. Well, turning away from the spending side of things and looking at revenues, uh, liberal groups and some Democratic lawmakers are discussing a package of new taxes that could potentially raise $40 billion annually, according to their math. And it would tap a variety of different income streams, including higher income taxes, uh, what is tantamount to a wealth tax, a new tax on Wall Street trades, and the list goes on and on. What do you think is the most progressive or fair way to increase taxes in New York moving forward? And do you think we need to have a broad package potentially capable of raising $40 billion? Or can we start smaller than that? The proposals that I'm familiar with are actually structured very well. Let me just say that I'm formerly a, a tax attorney and worked for a, a large international law firm in New York City before coming over to the Fiscal Policy Institute. So tax policy is really my major area of interest. Um, when you look at tax reform, it's important to take a very systematic view and make sure that you've covered certain fundamental categories of taxation. And generally, the proposals that I've seen from progressive organizations that are advocating to raise taxes, even in these very high revenue levels, are organized in exactly that way. So you would look at raising taxes on individual income, but you would also need to pay attention to raising taxes on business earnings. And then there's this additional category of wealth taxation very broadly um, that, that raises its own hairy questions, but is clearly very important to having a progressive system of taxation. And those hairy questions are, is that synonymous with legal questions? Yes. Well, okay. the, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, the state, the New York state constitution actually prohibits wealth tax, at least a wealth tax on intangibles. Now, one thing that you may or may not have thought about is that a property tax is actually a kind of wealth tax. So essentially everybody pays a wealth tax um, on their real property, but wealthy people generally hold uh, a, a lot of assets in the form of stocks and bonds and uh, company ownership, and and that can't be taxed under a conventional wealth tax in New York. But there are but there are other ways to effectively tax wealth. For instance, the estate tax, which has been hollowed out by years and years of uh, the creation of legal loopholes and a, a sophisticated estate tax planning industry. 
And, and there are other ways to get at the acute, this untaxed accumulation of wealth in the, uh, in the ultra rich and billionaire class. Well, do you have a preference or think there is a best practice in trying to raise revenue? Or do you think because this package looks at different forms of revenue and different types of revenue and different shape that wealth can take, that it makes sense to go with this broad approach? I think the broad approach is, is the right approach, um, partly because it allows you to get a, what in tax policy we call a broad base. And that's something that fiscal conservatives also often focus on, where you want your taxes to have the broadest set of things they're taxing. So to take an example, the income tax has a broad base and that everybody pays income tax. And you might think, hey, let's give a tax break to doctors because we like doctors, but that would just shift the burden of the income tax onto everyone else. So having a broad base keeps things fair, it raises more money, and it also causes fewer economic distortions. So a really broad-based approach to progressive tax reform would be to actually pick up all of these categories and say, okay, let's make the income tax more progressive, but let's also tax investment income, which is a tax preferred kind of income at the federal level. Let's raise our business taxes, but in a way that creates more parity between corporations and non-corporate businesses. And let's tax wealth in a way that addresses some of the big gaps in the system of uh, estate taxation that have arisen over the past few decades. And after a quick break, we'll continue our discussion with Nathan Gustorf, Executive Director of the Fiscal Policy Institute. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals in education, human services, and health care. For listeners just joining us, we're continuing our conversation with Nathan Gustorf, Executive Director of the Fiscal Policy Institute, which is supportive of increasing taxes on the wealthiest New Yorkers. Well, at what point do we increase taxes on wealthy New Yorkers so much that we effectively kill the goose that lay the golden egg? So this is one of the big questions in tax policy, especially state tax policy. And there are two different reasons why you could be concerned or why you might kill the golden goose. And one is migration. To what extent do people leave the state because taxes are too high? And that's really a state to state issue. And the other is to what extent does it strongly disincentivize behavior that people say stop doing business or stop going to work because taxes are too high. And we don't know exactly where that threshold is, but needless to say, tax rates in the U.S. used to be considerably higher, uh, mostly at the federal level, on individual incomes, on corporations. How, how many decades ago was that, though? If you look at like a chart of individual income taxation or corporate taxation, there's just been a steady decline from, say, the 60s. And that really reflects decades of policymakers on the left and on the right buying into neoliberal economic views that at this point, I think, hold a lot less sway in many policy communities. So as recently, we take a specific example, uh, income from dividends and interest and capital gains, the tax rates on that were cut by George W. Bush in the early 2000s. And now if you were to look at really high earners who have all of their income as investment income, and say, do they need a tax cut? Is that an economic incentive? Is the economy better off because billionaires pay even lower tax rates on their investment income as opposed to investing that in broad social services that reduce the cost of living for working people? I think you'd, you'd have to say no. So coming back to the question, though, at what point do we increase taxes in New York specifically where people are migrating 
to other states or moving their wealth around or spending more on not paying taxes than they might uh, be paying in actual taxes. What, what is that, that sweet spot? Because it sounds like we're just sort of moving along in the dark and hoping that we aren't falling off a cliff here. You know, I was talking about the economic concerns, but that tends to be the point that's raised less often in a state context. And the issue that's raised all the time is this concern about tax migration. Unfortunately, I can't approximate a rate where uh, we see the limit. But what we do know is that a lot of the concerns about tax migration of the rich are pretty significantly overstated. In 2017, Trump had his major legislative accomplishment, which was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And that limited the federal deduction for state and local taxes to just $10,000. So if you are a high earning taxpayer in a blue state with relatively high taxes, that basically amounted to a significant tax increase on you because you lost many tens of thousands of dollars of deductions from your federal taxes. An economic sociologist named Cristobal Young, along with the U.S. Treasury economist, studied the effects of that effective tax increase and saw that for high earning taxpayers, it had essentially no effect on migration and mobility. So it's pretty clear that there's a lot of room to raise taxes. Obviously, there is some theoretical limit, but you know, even the aggressive proposals probably don't get to the point where it would really have a, a, a behavioral effect. What should we make of recent tax filing data that indicates that our share of, say, the nation's highest earning filers has dropped precipitously and our share continues to decline compared to what we might have had 10 years ago um, or really even 12 years ago prior to the latest incarnation of a, a temporary higher income tax surcharge uh, back in 2010? Well, there's a certain subtlety there that's interesting, which is New York's share of the nation's high earners is different from the number of high earners in New York. Our concern should really be how many people here are high earners who pay a lot of tax, and ultimately, what's the effect on our revenues? Because that's what we care about. And revenues in the past few years have been very strong, and they've actually substantially exceeded uh, state government projections of revenues. If you just look at the financial plans, revenues have, have come in 20 to 30% above predictions. Now, to your question, what about our share of the high earners? Well, there's been significant growth in all kinds of sectors in other states. That doesn't necessarily reflect anything about what's going on in New York. So the fact that uh, there's a booming tech sector in California or that the securities industry has grown throughout the country, that doesn't mean that those jobs would somehow otherwise be in New York or that New York's economy is in the dumps. Really, it's, it's, that just tells us about what's going on in those other states. Um, but it could be a, a viewed as a reflection of New York, though. You could say that the tax climate, for example, isn't friendly enough to prompt those job creation activities here in New York. And the only way we can develop them here is with massive subsidies, like what we saw recently in central New York uh, with the package that brought Micron to the Syracuse area. You you could say that, but you would be Wrong. essentially conflating a few different... Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, because you'd be conflating a few different categories. So one of the really standout categories of job growth for high earners is the securities industry. And we generally don't give tax breaks to people who are securities traders, partly because no one thinks there's any need to do that. And there'd probably be a lot of political backlash. What about tax breaks for their uh, purchases of yachts and airplanes? I think everyone probably is very unsympathetic to that. And you'd be hard pressed <laughs> to, to conclude empirically that it's had any beneficial effect on the business environment. <laughs> First, I just want to say the securities industry is interesting because this has always been very prominent in New York, but it wasn't always a huge part of the economy. But the process of general financialization in the U.S. and in the global economy has led to the growth of the securities industry all over the place. So I think that one in particular really doesn't make sense to imagine that 
the growth of traders elsewhere in the country somehow is shows people who would have otherwise been in New York, but instead decided to open up shop in, in Denver. It's really just the growth of the industry in Denver. Now, to your question, that's really uh, about a very different part of the economy, which is manufacturing. And there's this real interest that's now grown in the national political and policy conversation about how, what do we do about manufacturing? How do we reshore semiconductors? How do we do a green industrial transition? I mean, that is a very current and challenging topic. You'd have to say that most of the business subsidies in New York State are not targeted in a way that's consistent with, say, the policy aims of the Federal Inflation Reduction Act. And there's pretty compelling evidence from many states that those sorts of business subsidies really aren't doing their job in terms of economic development. That's probably the biggest area of the state budget where there is just a lot of wasted money. In principle, it might be possible to have a strategic approach to incentivizing certain kinds of manufacturing, especially these high-tech sectors. But even there, we see in something like the Buffalo Billions, in a state like New York, the risk of corruption and the risk of badly designed policy is so high that you can you really risk losing a huge amount of money that could otherwise be spent in these kinds of productive social service sectors. It's hard to mitigate that risk. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. We've been speaking with Nathan Gustdorf, Executive Director of the Fiscal Policy Institute. Nathan, thank you so much for making the time and I look forward to chatting with you in the future. Thank you for having me on. and I'll also look forward to our next conversation. Support for Capital Press Room provided by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. Communities across the Empire State have stories to tell. A roadside marker funded by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation can help your town or city educate the public, encourage pride of place, and promote local tourism. More about the Pomeroy Foundation's New York State Historic Marker Grant Program for 501c3 organizations, nonprofit academic institutions, and local state and federal government entities at wgpfoundation.org.